OK, so I'm going to get seriously speculative here. Many scientists will no doubt consider everything in the vision space portfolio as falling into this category, as what's articulated essentially derives intuitively to be then overlain with the science to see if anything aligns. There's certainly a lot that doesn't. The fundamentals of vision space are unashamedly subjective and remain untested in the empirical sense because no one will venture the resources to develop the initial technology to a position where it would be possible to generate an appropriate test environment from which to expand the associations. As it turns out, there's not much I can do about that. If reality is something we generate as biological systems, forming a relationship with the physically real, then reality must to some extent be subjective. Subjectivity being something that we must understand and account for, not least because it's going to contain information pertinent to the way we are embedded within the universe. Why? Because our sense of vision informs us with respect to our relationship to light. It's absolutely fundamental. We need to understand what's involved in us being objective in order that we can be so at remote scales. Vision space asserts that it's meaningless to take us, who perform the observation, from the act or processes of observation either by resorting to conceptual thought experiments or by having instrumentation stand in for us without first coming to terms with what's actually involved on both an experiential and hence physical basis. We need to be able to plot a way out of our minds into the universe. If we can't do that then we are simply not doing physics. Why do I designate this particular presentation speculative? Because on an experiential basis, I can't reach into the areas I'm attempting to describe or depict. I can't access the relationships that exist between the factors. I attempt to articulate aspects of the mechanism of mind by inference, by inferring from what little I can determine on an experiential basis about the phenomenon. To some extent, I've touched on this area previously in presentations dealing with self-reference and dynamical systems where we start to discover how we encounter ourselves in relation to the scene being viewed and from what basis could the phenomenon be forming. Here I'm trying to reach for an extension of the basic mechanism where contributions from memory are also able to influence our presentations. We do see these contributions from memory but they rarely actually contribute to what presents within visual field. Perhaps we can think of them as being abstracted in some way. I've tried to expand the paradigm by introducing notional phenomenal field. Phenomenal field being distinct from visual field, which merely defines the extents of the physical world that the optics of the eyes cover at any one point in time. Contributions from memory appear to be largely internal presentations, as opposed to occurring externally, out there, forming the real world. This may be analogous in some way to listening to music through headphones, where the music occurs within our heads and is not appreciable as a source located or projected into the external environment. If you followed previous vision space presentations, then you will understand that I consider dynamical systems to be the best fit for the mechanism driving the phenomenon of vision. The natural extension is that our entire multi-dimensional perceptual system is dynamical in nature. Hence, contributions from memory would be iterations forming in accordance with the dynamical system that forms perceptual structure. This in turn generates experiential awareness, the human unworld. In the presentation The Protagonists, I propose that there are essentially three contributors, or engines. Two coming from an explicit and implicit take on reality that can be associated with the dorsal and ventral stream, and one from mind, that's generated to mediate these and draw from experience where required in order to realize the best possible impression of what's going on out there with respect to our condition and so how to act. As we know this process is not foolproof. A tuft of grass in a field can become a rabbit. We see rabbit until information arrives that disrupts the percept to allow us to reconsider the data and the rabbit then miraculously morphs into the tuft of grass. Association and past experience attempt to resolve perceptual ambiguity, i.e. we take an informed guess and mould our perceptual awareness to fit. So in these circumstances we don't just conceptually think rabbit in the field, we see a rabbit in the field. 
Central vision must to some extent be adaptable, open to suggestive input from memory when required. Mental imagery can infiltrate visual field. Even in the macular region of vision, we have to acknowledge the hallucinatory nature of the phenomenon over that of optical projection. Within Phenomenal Field, we've looked in some detail at how the implicit and explicit takes on reality, amassed from their respective systems, play out and are composed in accordance with our intent in the world. We've also started to consider the nature of extreme peripheral vision, where we can determine or postulate that the increasing condensation appreciable across Phenomenal Field reduces to something akin to an active boundary or event horizon more than a fade to black. Now we don't see this condensation. It's difficult to perceive or appreciate even when we look for it. To us everything is considered to be in proportion as we look out into the environment. Consequently we've delivered central perspective and lived within the paradigm of optical projection that we engineer to set out the world in proportion as we understand from experience that the physical world is like this and not condensing. So our blindness to condensation within the phenomenon is not some sort of oversight on our behalf. We need to be able to deal with the actual situations we encounter in the physical world so we interpret what we perceive. We possess mechanisms that extrapolate or overcome or unfold the situation. We deduce experiential reality passively and actively at every level as opposed to merely detect it. Variable perspective is common in Eastern depiction, and obviously we can amass through multiple fixations made over time using our explicit form of attention enough to distill from the experience the notional illusionary space of perspective. This process has largely led the activities of visual artists since the last Renaissance to the 17th century, as they built and amassed plots taken from multiple fixations relating them all to form pictures. Picture space and subsequently the intellectual basis for third-party observation. As these distillations started to stand in as reality, and then for reality. And as indicated, this position actually involves significant upfront processes of rationalization and builds away from the experiential encounter. So the third-party observer approach to the nature of reality adopted by science derived at least in part from the development of the geometry of central perspective, which is a fudge. The veracity of third-party observation is as illusionary as central perspective is compelling. It does not occur to us on an experiential level and it doesn't present reality at all, not even close, barely related in fact. In addition to the coping mechanism adopted by our explicit system, we also appear to accommodate condensation in time as part of our implicit form of holistic spatial awareness. If we attend to peripheral vision, we also don't really see the scale changes associated with condensation. We certainly don't appreciate moving objects getting shorter as they move away from an object we're holding in fixation. That would be illogical. I think this is all indicating something fundamental about the mechanism governing the whole of perceptual structure. What if this facility to address and unfold information from what we will call multiple angles extended beyond the extents of what it was possible to view in terms of field of vision, i.e. is this how mind attends to multidimensional planes where it's possible to access past experience from memory on a consecutive basis? The boundary at the extreme periphery would contain the conditions where this enfolded potential would be accessed. Thinking about the situation in these terms may allow us to consider the relationships between the factors and how they relate to the relevant math. To my mind these considerations are strongly suggested of an interlinking of dynamical systems, phase space and perceptual structure. We're looking for multidimensional space with various phase planes. I've drawn two such encounters that support contextual spatial awareness through previous fixations. One on the back of the stool and the other on the lamp head. No maps are being generated as we encounter the world. Maps are conceptualizations about the world that we have learned to relate to. 
We should think of these mental image sequences as embedded within the boundary. Perhaps we consider them as set at 90 degrees to the page, so effectively invisible as we look ahead, but available to minds multidimensional or multidirectional form of attention. If we then consider what's taking place in the remaining two mental images, we can see contributions from longer term memory, augmenting the visual encounter. First a rather scribbled version of a vase that I drew a long time ago, an image that reminds me of what I'm encountering in the scene in front of me, and then also of Cezanne's blue vase painting. These images represent an abstracted train of thought, appearing as distinct from the task of evaluating the raw data from the real setting in front of me. I am thinking about the situation. Is this analogous to a dynamical system's bifurcation? Notice that there's no self-reference of nose and arm appearing in this train of thought. Perhaps this is one way that mind can establish that a dream is a dream and a mental image is a recall and not actually occurring. It's the same dynamical system that generates mental images and visual images that would also be responsible for gene sequences. It's just that the primary input feed to the dynamical system that varies. I guess this also indicates that there's no essential difference between consciousness and awareness. We perceive the world and think about it, but it's essentially the same dynamical system in play. Chasing a notional state of consciousness with a distinct physics, confined to or centred around an area of the brain, is akin to chasing a pot of gold residing at the end of a rainbow. A quest initiated by an approach to the nature of reality that embraces third-party objectivity. I don't see the so-called hard problem. For me, the hard problem is the product of an issue with approach. There are, of course, going to be a great diversity of dynamical systems and degrees of complexity typified by a range of biofications and protagonists. For example, an animals will be dependent on its particular ecological niche and associated unwelt. Humans would appear to develop a heightened sense of self-awareness, this allowing us to interrogate and affect the world in unique ways. Interestingly, however, if we choose to be run by or live through our current instrumentation in what we incorrectly term virtual reality, we will ultimately diminish self-awareness, diminish who we are, a process that, in my opinion, is now in full spate. I think our communication technologies should seek to imitate our perceptual structure and by so doing expand the depth of contextual awareness and hence the speed of comprehension. Vision space affords the potential for us to explore the human unwelt and the development of commensurate information display systems will enhance communication. Awareness and hence experiential reality being a dance mediated and augmented by mind in multidimensional space.